sorry. <clears throat> Before that, so DFO established the marine refuge. It's got a crazy shape because they're trying to find that balance between protecting the most habitat and also having the minimum impact on the fishery. So these gray dots there, that's all the fishing footprint. So they're trying to cut the shape of the enclosure around the fishing footprint. This little cutout here was a result of a negotiation between the fishing industry and an NGO. So <clears throat> the, uh, the, the NGO said, okay, you can have that if we get 40,000 40, square kilometers of sponge habitat for the north. And the industry said, okay. <clears throat> so again, these are these other area, effective area-based conservation measures are very much negotiated uh, entities. So one of the questions is how deep do the corals go? So we started looking in, uh, into deeper water using the drop camera that Barbara mentioned, but also this year looking at two dives that were in the 600 to, to 800 meter range. <clears throat> so and in particular, I want to draw your attention to this one. So we're looking at multiple data collected during last year's cruise. We noticed this funny feature. We didn't know what it was and thought, that's funny. It looks kind of like a slump scar. But what would be causing a slump in that area? And so this comes back, so <clears throat> here it is with the shaded bathymetry, so you can see it more clearly. The, uh, the green is where the ROV went, and the yellow is where it was actually on the bottom because of the strong currents, okay? <clears throat> so, as Barbara mentioned, it has what we think might be behind that slump. It's the fact that there's this cold seam here. Here are the microbial maps uh, that, that show the evidence of the cold seam. The other interesting thing here is these... Uh, crusts. These are called carbonate crusts or orthogenic carbonates. When you have hydrocarbons bubbling out of the bottom, they interact with the seawater and it precipitates calcium carbonate, which makes it a discrete habitat for the corals. Most of the corals in this area were not growing on the crusts, most of them were growing on boulders. But it is, uh, it is feeding into it. <clears throat> the last thing to note is we did see some evidence of fishing inside the marine refuge. We don't know if the fishing line is more than four years old or if it is somebody who is either unaware of or disregarding the rules. So, who cares? Why is this even important? <clears throat> Let's go back 10 years ago to a paper describing the distribution of cold seeps in the Northwest Atlantic. So, these dots here are all cold seeps identified from satellite imagery. So, radar sat it measures the size of the waves. Where you have a hydrocarbon seep, the hydrocarbons actually dampen the waves on the surface. And they were noting the correspondence between the occurrence of the, the cold seeps and the occurrence of the corals, which has also been described in the, in the northeastern land. Now, in this case, we think that not very many of the corals are growing on the crusts, and we don't think that they're metabolically dependent upon the hydrocarbon seeps, but we will be trying to find that out using stable isotopes. And again, uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to skip over that one. Back to the Lithidia site. So um, Barbara showed you the picture of the coral bycatch, and I just wanted to show you something about these steep rock walls and the geomorphology of the site. So the year before we went there, a German ship, because this, this was such an exciting find, this Lithidia site, a German ship had gone there and collected the multibeam data. And so this is the slope raster of that multibeam data in that area. The redder it is, the steeper the slope, and so this slopes up to 89 degrees. Pretty steep, okay? And so, and the, the tracks here show you the distributions of the dives. So very, very steep rock walls, and they're all oriented in a certain direction. Barbara showed you pictures of what the coral, uh, corals themselves look like. Reef-like knolls, but growing on these vertical rock walls, facing into these strong currents. So uh, uh, my undergraduate honor student, Yuthika Jalim, did this for her part of for her honors, looking at the distributions of the corals by depth, but also with regards to orientation. And so the corals are all facing one specific direction to the south, into the southeast where the currents are coming from. And if you look at the other kinds of fauna in the other area, all the other types of sponges or other kinds of corals other than Lupedia have a much wider range of distributions. So again, the interaction of the nature of the bedrock, geo, uh, bedrock geomorphology in this case and the biota living on them. Okay. And again, the important habitat for fish. Okay, let's change gears. A species that has been overlooked of corals in our waters is Achenella arbuscula, and this is a species that Laura Piccarillo was working on for her master's degree. So thank you, Laura, for these pictures. Uh, <clears throat> this is a species that is very widespread, but it's not very big and not very showy. Ironically, some of the fishermen say, it stinks. 
and they even report a feeding nauseous when it comes up in the nest. It's called a bamboo coral because it has these segments to its skeleton, so you can see the calcite internodes and the protein nodes. And if you cut open those nodes, you can see the growth lines. <clears throat> so this is under plain light. This is under fluorescent light, uh, a fluorescence microscope. So you can count the growth lines. We think the growth lines are annual, but we're trying to verify that. So <clears throat> with the help of a DFO grant, we were able to build these coral staining chambers and deploy them this year. So here's one of those small corals underneath. Uh, they're about to get stained. <clears throat> we go on. Gosh. Okay, so this is the, the calcine or flu uh, calcine fluorescent dye, which is being going to be in the chamber. The coral gets stained for about six hours, and then in two years' time, we'll go back and collect the same very same coral. We've got mark markers out there, and we know precisely where it is. Uh, to verify the growth banding of those of, of those uh, coral like, of the growth bands. The reason we want to know that for sure is that it matters quite a lot how old these corals are in terms of their ability to recover from from damage, including fisheries damage. So uh, that's Laura's project. <clears throat> this is a muddy bottom, very different from most of what we've been seeing um, elsewhere. Most of the coral habitats are typically pretty rocky bottoms. And uh, so if you look at it, it doesn't look like very much. The corals are pretty small. They're mostly like 10 centimeters high and smaller. So not a very visually impressive environment compared to some of the others, but again, quite important. Oh. I'm gonna skip this because we're worthy. Okay, Barbara mentioned the bamboo coral forest. So this is where we get back into the question of how long have these habitats been in existence? So one of the things we did this year was some uh, piston coring and gravity coring in that site. <laughs> That's the sound of the thrusters. Okay. The important thing to note here in that video is you see all the mud accumulated between the corals. Think of a snow fence. So the snow fence is accumulating the snow, uh, and then where, where you don't have a snow fence, there's, it's, you might have a barren area with almost no, snow, no accumulation of snow there. The same thing with these corals underneath the water. They are accumulating the mud that is drifting past them in the current. So we took cores in 2016 and, uh, and again this year, to try to look at what's the age of these. So the large scale topography here is in the underpinning, but in the small scale topography is what we see with those corals accumulating the sediments. So <clears throat> you take a core, uh, it's a, a piston or gravity core going down through the, through the mud. The indications here are in depth of the core in centimeters. You'll notice that all the little white things there are coral fragments. So you get down to about 130 centimeters depth in this core and you see the transition from mud background to gravel, and there's a coral right at the base of that. The, uh, the age of the coral, the radiocarbon age is 2,600 years, so it's approximately 2,000 uh, calendar years old, and we can age the gravel elsewhere in a different core from the same location as being about 13,000 years. So two immediate questions there are, all right, is this site representative or not? Hence the need to collect more cores. But secondly, what happened there for 11,000 years? And why was there any, not any deposition of sediment? So that's a geological question we will not be able to answer here because we don't have a record. Um, and just to show you again, this is what we would do with that is developing an age model. I can't point with my left, left arm yet. Um, <clears throat> of uh, the depth in the core versus the ages of the corals down it. So a very consistent and continuous occupation of that habitat by those corals. Okay. Last thing, there's a big difference between the eastern side and the western side of Baffin Bay. And in particular, uh, that has to do with, um, uh, it may have to do with water temperature, but also carbonate saturation. So here's an example of those carnivorous bunches that, that Barbara mentioned, which we think might be playing the same kind of role as corals typically. So working with uh, Kamiko Azetsu Scott at uh, Bedford Institute of Oceanography, we've been looking at the carbonate saturation of 
the waters in the, Lord, in the northern Labrador Sea and uh, Baffin Bay. So these are the uh, ages of, of uh, the dates of earlier acquisitions. We sampled more water this summer. <clears throat> so it's a complicated diagram. This one shows you pressure equals last and telling you the depth on the bottom of each one of the sites. And then this is the diagram we're going to look at in more detail. This is the carbonate saturation value um, at, the bottom, at the bottom in each location. So there it is bigger. <clears throat> Zero, or one means it's fully saturated. That is to say, anything under than one, the, wa the water is undersaturated with respect to, a, to aragonite. So an aragonite skeleton is going to want to dissolve. Anything above that, if, it make, if the coral can make a skeleton, it's not right away going to dissolve. However, it's still going to cost that organism energy in order to make those skeletons. There's a Lufidia site, 1.4. Right in this, still in that tolerable zone. And again, looking at that tris transition across the Davis Strait still, notice we're getting into less and less saturated waters as we go further north and west. Uh, so, this may be one of the limiting factors for the distributions of corals in our area is that carbonate saturation. <clears throat> okay, last thing. Scott and the full of surprises, again, a glacial trough. And so, one of the things I wanted to, wanted to point out is explaining. Uh, this trough is a very different kind of trough from, uh, from the COVID. Uh, it's, uh, again, it's glacially carved, but what's happening at the margins of it? And so uh, this is where the cold seep is happening. And those cold seeps are both causing orthogenic carbonate uh, formation, but they might also be causing local erosion. So this is zooming in on the very, very edge of that trough in about 200 meters of water depth and a very steep uh, precipice on the edge of that with these heavily eroded cemented sediments. It's not bedrock. It's this cemented, carbonate cemented sediment. Probably, well, we don't know its age. That's one of the questions. We'd like to go back and sample it to determine its age. The other interesting thing there is we can determine that uh, there are there is local turbidite sedimentation happening from the top of that flowing down into the trough. So these troughs are fascinating areas with this rich biodiversity. Each one's a little bit different. So to understand it, we have to look at the geology and the oceanography and the biology. We come to the end of our session. Thank you. Thank you all. I think we're going to take that. Is there a class coming in here now? Something. Uh, it's a class. Okay. Right, I guess that means we don't have time for questions. <laughs> 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 <laughs>